And then it suddenly became clear to me that as a young journalist, I was very one-sided in my reporting. It was always about the good cause. Just like now, people write that Russian businessmen must be expropriated. They think it's about the good cause. They believe Putin wants to restore the Soviet Union or the Tsarist Empire, and that's why he invades one country after another. Many journalists think they must not report on criminal behavior, for example, in the government in Kyiv, because it would harm the good cause. Hello and herzlich willkommen auf Neutrality Studies. Hello and welcome to Neutrality Studies today, exceptionally for an interview in German. Because today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Dr. Helmut Schaben, a long-standing German and Swiss journalist. After his doctorate at the University of Bonn, Dr. Schaben first worked for five years as a press agency reporter and correspondent in Mexico and Central America, before becoming an editor at the weekly newspaper WOS in Zurich in 1986. From 1993 to 2012, he was then an editor and reporter at Swiss television SRF, including 16 years on the Tagesschau, the most important daily news broadcast in Switzerland. Dr. Schaben has spent many years as a media professional dealing with war and, in recent years, increasingly with the portrayal of war in the media, that is, with the portrayal and image of war in local journalism. Last year, he published an essay titled, This is how I lost faith in the established media. We want to talk about this and about propaganda in our media landscape today. Hello, Mr. Dr. Scheben. Yes, good day, Mr. Lauder. Mr. Scheben, you write in your highly readable essay the following. I was deceived by the media myself, but it took a long time before I became aware of it. Süddeutsche Zeitung, Frankfurter Rundschau, Neue Zürcher Zeitung, Der Spiegel, and other newspapers were my leading media when I was learning journalism. What happened to you? How were you deceived, and when did you notice? Wie wurden Sie getäuscht, und wann haben Sie das bemerkt? Yes, that's a long story. I would actually have to go back to my time in Latin America. There, I worked as a journalist for a while and only realized afterward how strongly I was affected by an internal censorship. At that time, I practiced advocacy journalism, which sided with the leftist insurgent and popular movements in Latin America. It was just a different time. As a young world revolutionary, one also felt obliged as a journalist to support the popular and insurgent movements in Latin America. It only became clear to me later that I would not have written anything that could have harmed the revolution. That is, my reporting was very one-sided. Anything that did not serve the good cause was airbrushed away or, one might say, almost surgically removed. And the good thing by that I mean the popular uprisings in Latin America, which were common at the time, the armed uprisings and the newspapers, the media for which I worked back then, were largely left-wing media. For example, the Berliner Taz or the Waz, the weekly newspaper in Zurich, but also left-wing media in Mexico. For example, I occasionally wrote an article for El Dia, a left liberal newspaper in Mexico, and other left-wing media in Latin America. I had the advantage that I could write in both languages. I noticed at the time that the TAS, the Berlin Daily Newspaper, for example, would not have printed an article that critically dealt with the internal problems in the guerrilla movement. So, for example, settling scores with the submachine gun, internal reckonings, certain Stalinist tendencies, that is, shooting people because they were so-called traitors or politically unreliable, I could name many examples. In any case, at that time, such things would not have been printed in the media I worked for. It simply would not have been printed. I later realized that this, of course, applies not only to engagement on the left side, but also just as much to engagement on the right side. You've referred to it as stance journalism, right? I'm actually somewhat ambivalent about that. If the stance journalism comes from a corner where you know what you're getting, 
it bothers me less. So, with Watts, with Tats, I know I'm reading a left-wing paper. It's then clear to me that a left-wing perspective is being presented. But when newspapers try to act as if they are the objective truth, then I have a problem with it. You have to inform the readership on which side of the spectrum you stand when you're spreading a narrative. Hasn't journalism lost its way when today almost every newspaper claims to be practicing quality journalism that reflects reality? Yes, of course. I later experienced this from the other side as well. For me, the moment I became politically aware was during the Balkan Wars. I was in Croatia and Bosnia several times. I found out that our media reported something completely different from what was actually happening on the ground. I had a similar experience later in Syria. If I remember correctly, I traveled to Syria in 2016 after speaking with a former American CIA man, a very renowned CIA analyst, Ray McGovern. He told me that something completely different is being told in Washington than what is actually happening in Syria. He said that the same lies are being told about the war in Syria as were told about the Iraq war back then. When I traveled to Syria, I experienced a completely different country than what is generally depicted in the Western media. A picture was painted of a people oppressed by a terrible tyrant, Assad, where anyone who disagrees is constantly tortured, and so on. I don't know how to put it, but I believe less and less in a kind of journalism that is committed to a good cause in the sense of, we shouldn't say this because it harms the good cause. Because they did not find that in Syria, they say, this people oppressed by Assad. Because that is the narrative that was the case in Syria, according to our media back home. Yes, of course. There was always talk only of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of refugees. Meanwhile, about 20 million people stayed there and supported their government. These people were practically not reported on. The reports were always only about the fleeing war refugees who fled from torture and so on. Today, it is known that a large part of the young people who fled back then were partly jihadists who had laid down their arms because it was pointless or because they had fled. But back then, every Syrian refugee who arrived in Berlin, Paris, or London knew that he had to say he was tortured and persecuted by Assad or his family or his brother was to get asylum immediately. That's how it worked. Indeed, there were people who were tortured and oppressed. There were repressions in Syria. But in our media, it was portrayed as if a tyrant was oppressing his people. It was not at all considered that it was a civil war and that this civil war had been planned by the USA and NATO countries for a long time. The plans were in the drawer, which can be documented. So my trust in the major media has been quite shaken. The interesting thing is that you are a media person. You have worked in the media all your life and seen it from the inside. In your report, you write about how realities are created by repeating certain images or omitting images. You mentioned that it was illegal in the USA to show images of dead US soldiers in the Iraq war. The USA learned a lot from the propaganda disaster of the Vietnam War. The first images that come to my mind are of the withdrawal from Afghanistan two and a half years ago, but that seemed somehow planned. Even then, I felt that it was okay to show a withdrawal with images. But otherwise, images are often used to lie as well. Could you briefly talk about that? Yes, of course. This includes, for example, the tactics, the strategy of the NATO countries in these kinds of wars. I now mention the bombing of Belgrade or the bombing of Libya as examples. There is a very specific strategy. The national television stations are destroyed first. In Libya, the national television station was bombed in the first few days, and thereafter no images were seen of the following NATO attacks. The NATO Supreme Command that led these operations was located in Naples at the time. 
I tried to make this public. For example, I went to Amnesty International, to the office in Zurich, and asked where the images of the NATO attacks were. You always just see planes taking off from aircraft carriers in the Mediterranean at sunset or sunrise. Wonderful pictures. The war thus appears aseptic and clinically clean. You see absolutely no images of the destruction caused by the NATO airstrikes in Syria. At Amnesty, they then said, yes, that's true, the television stations were bombed, and we are also very concerned that a part of this war, namely the consequences of the bombings, is visually excluded. These images simply could not be seen in the television news broadcasts. And in Belgrade, during NATO's war of aggression against the rest of Yugoslavia, it was the same. The television station was bombed, even though it had nothing to do with military targets. Sixteen people died in the attack on the television studios in Belgrade. I would like to emphasize once again that my political shaping took place during the Balkan Wars. There, I experienced how massively lies were told. I tried to counteract them. I know both from my own experience and from other journalists who aimed for a more balanced reporting, examples of how they were attacked by a group of mainstream journalists. A colleague from the Weltwoche, which was then a rather left liberal paper and is now more conservative, told me that he had tried to publish a counterstatement to show how propaganda stories were made up. He told me that he should be happy if he could keep his job. It seems as if there is a reflexive mechanism among many journalists to attack someone who questions the official narrative. This has personally happened to me in my journalistic activity as well. When did it happen to you? For example, it happened to me once when I was still working at Tagesschau. On the side, I had published an article in an online newspaper under the title Urinating in Afghanistan. This article was about American soldiers urinating on corpses. This image had also been widely spread in the media in the USA and had caused great uproar and outrage. The then Secretary of State, I believe it was Hillary Clinton, said that such an attitude towards corpses did not reflect the values of the American people and the American army. I wrote a commentary in which I asked, that's all well and good, but where are these values? Where have they manifested themselves? For example, in the use of the dioxin poison Agent Orange in Vietnam, which resulted in hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese children being born crippled, or in the terrible torture practices in Bagram in Afghanistan. There is a 2,000-page secret internal report by the American army on this, or in Abu Ghraib or Guantanamo and so on. Then I was called into my boss's office. He called me and told me that I was not allowed to write such things because it violated my employment contract. It states that extreme political positions are prohibited. Extreme political positions. Yes, I replied, where is the extreme? I wrote the same thing that was in the Washington Post and even in the Herald Tribune and New York Times. The response from the then head of the Tagesschau was, I haven't read it yet, but someone from above has complained. And I asked, who has complained? The answer was, I can't tell you that. But you also want to spend the time you have left here at the Tagesschau without any problems. That was actually a direct threat and not good advice. I backed down at the time because I was already older and it would not have been easy to find another job. But that's just one example of how it works. Although, and this will probably be your next question, I do not assume that this direct repression, this direct censorship from the boss to the employees is the usual thing. The matter is much more subtle and much more complicated. Yes, because the interesting thing is that we have a media landscape with media creators. I believe you also write this in your report. Most journalists do not want to lie or spread falsehoods. At most, they feel that they need to slightly adjust their reporting, or they sense the self-censorship, as we say in German. Where does this come from? 
It can't just be the love for the job or self-preservation if one simply conforms. Doesn't it also have to do with the ideological selection of the people who actually make it to the top? Noam Chomsky described in his work, Manufacturing Consent, that the system is set up in a way that there is a process of self-selection. Would you agree that the higher you climb, the more you conform to the current system? Yes, that is absolutely correct. It is an extremely complicated matter. Chomsky was once asked in an interview by a journalist whether he was suggesting that the journalist was lying. Chomsky replied, I'm not saying you're lying, I'm just saying you wouldn't be in your job if you didn't write what you do. It's, how should I put it, our entire socialization is determined by ideology, by stories we tell each other. And we live in these stories. I always bring up the example of little Max. Mom and dad are constantly arguing. Then unexpectedly, Aunt Emma visits. Little Max knows exactly that he must not tell Aunt Emma that mom and dad are always arguing. That's how we grow up. From a young age, we learn that in certain situations, belonging is more important than truth. Regarding the pictures, I like to quote a friend of mine, a mountain guide and photographer, Robert Bosch, also known as Schraubi Bosch, from Switzerland. He once said that press images and media images often tend to lie. If I get the assignment from Stern magazine to show how over-civilized and terribly built up the Alps are, then I take those photos in the same landscape where I shoot when Switzerland tourism gives me the assignment to show how wonderfully romantic the Swiss mountains are. That's the problem. A journalist friend, Karen Lukefeld, told me that a cameraman said to her, you only see what you know. This means you can only see what you know. You always know in advance what you will see. You have in mind which pictures you need. And I think that's where the problem lies. We are so influenced by our entire life history, our environment, by ideology, but also by the pressure to belong and want to belong. It is very difficult for journalists to stand against the published opinion, against the majority opinion at a certain moment. And this majority opinion is, of course, as Chomsky rightly pointed out, produced in a political process, the manufacturing consent. The interesting thing about the history of war, which I focus on the most, is that there are always key moments when extreme lies are spread. These lies are then maintained for quite a long time until they eventually collapse. But at the moment they collapse, no one is interested anymore. Examples include weapons of mass destruction, the Gulf of Tonkin, the story about the babies from the incubator in Kuwait. This list could go on indefinitely. Or take the Maidan uprising, which was portrayed as a popular uprising, where the evil Yanukovych was supposed to have shot at his own people. By now, we know that this is not true. Even the Ukrainians say that it is not true. They have investigated these cases and come to the conclusion that it does not correspond to the truth. But no one is interested in that anymore because politics is the art of dominating the narrative for the current six weeks. How can we explain that these lies, which keep coming from the same people, still spread in the media landscape again and again? Not everyone believes them. There are dissenters who caution, but these are immediately shouted down. Where does this reflex come from to shout down those who say, wait, this could also be a lie? Yes, where the reflex comes from, I might not be able to answer precisely. But one factor is certainly the editorial conference. There, it could be said that some scientists claim a change in the Gulf Stream could lead to an ice age and not a warming of the climate. I can imagine that the editor-in-chief decides in the morning editorial meeting not to emphasize this topic too much because it would question the current opinion. I observed something similar during the corona period. Critical scientists expressed that the vaccine had been developed too quickly and was not safe enough. One must be careful and cannot simply put 100% of the population under quarantine 
when the virus is not deadly or particularly severe for 98% of the people. There are moments when public opinion is so strong that certain representations are eagerly absorbed by the media and a large number of people because they exactly express what the emotional and mental needs of the people are at that moment. Emotionalen und mentalen Bedürfnisse der Leute in dem Moment sind. Also das mm. Foto von Bergamo, von den Lastwagen in Bergamo, das ist ja... The photo of the trucks in Bergamo is fascinating. It was striking how politicians of all stripes said we need to introduce lockdowns and carry out mass vaccination. We must vaccinate billions of people worldwide immediately. Otherwise, we risk conditions like in Bergamo. The photo showed nothing but a few military trucks passing by at night. In the meantime, it has turned out that the number of corona-related deaths was not higher than that of a normal severe flu in Italy, both in this region and in the whole country. However, the photo was presented as if military trucks had to be provided to collect the many corpses. The real reason for the use of these trucks was that the government had decided to cremate all corona deaths immediately. These individuals were buried without delay. Since the crematorium in Bergamo was too small, as normally not so many cremations would occur at the same time, the trucks had to be used. In a country where people are usually buried, they resorted to this means of transport, the military, to drive people from one crematorium to other crematoriums everywhere at a moment's notice. That was the real reason why these trucks were on the move. But it was here. Yes, that is for me one of the classic examples. Yeah. The interesting thing about this is the narrative that we narrowly escaped mass death during the corona phase and only survived thanks to the good measures. This narrative still exists today. Many people now get angry when they hear this. How can one question corona? It is deadly. Many people have died. How can someone say something so evil? It is evil. Journalism also collapsed three years ago. There were only a few voices left, which were all the louder. Boris Reitschuster is one of the greatest heroes in the history of German journalism, and Gunnar Kaiser was one of the most important philosophers of the last 20 to 30 years, who unfortunately died of cancer. These voices were paid even more attention because they were needed. For me, that was fascinating because I was in Japan. Japan followed a very different Corona strategy, similar to Sweden. Sweden was outwardly portrayed as if it were the USA, but in reality, it functioned more like Sweden, or at least very similarly. I have also experienced how media in Switzerland portray this. They present it as the only possible answer, the only option. Anything else would lead to immediate death. Scientists have said this, and this narrative that science has said it is incredibly dangerous. But most people are not yet aware of this. As a politician or scientist, I can say as clearly as possible that it must not be portrayed like this. It's a making believe, especially in models. I still don't understand it to this day. It was a mass psychosis, I absolutely agree with you. But that it could then become so all-encompassing and that now, three years later, it has also been forgotten, is astonishing. It's as if it just went away. It was a pause, a gap of two years in people's memories. So just to correct that, I might add that I am not at all a person who is against vaccinations. I'm not against children being vaccinated against childhood diseases. I'm also convinced that it was a very dangerous virus and that older people and vulnerable individuals, meaning people with a significantly weakened immune system, should have been protected. I completely understand that. I just think that for me, the phenomenon, the media phenomenon, and as you say, the immediate willingness of many people to accept these measures, which were simply based on belief, was problematic. It was no longer about promoting the body's natural immunity and natural defenses. Instead, it was acted as if these did not exist at all. All hope was placed on a vaccination. And this is, of course, based on the belief that we have nature under control. 
We have everything under control. If we are just strict enough with people and shut everything down, implement a complete lockdown, then we could defeat this virus, which is of course complete madness. That is the craziest thing I have ever heard. And the interesting thing is also the choice of words, defeating. During the corona period, there was a lot of war rhetoric. So at the front, the frontline workers, the war against the virus, the struggle, the everyday battle, it was really war rhetoric. I already thought back then that probably the only thing that could drive corona out of our minds would be a war. I thought it would be a war with Iran. It turns out that the war in Ukraine then pushed corona into the background. This thema crowded out. That is also fascinating. So at the moment when the war in Ukraine began, the Ukraine crisis, Corona was no longer a topic. Yes, that's how media works. This is the mental space in our head. We only have limited space, just like the newspapers. And then one topic dominates everything for a certain period of time. Yes, as I said, I only came back to things in my older age that I experienced as a young man, for example, in Latin America. It suddenly became clear to me how one-sided I was as a young journalist in my reporting. It was always about the good cause, just like some write today that Russian businessmen must be expropriated. They think it's about the good cause. They believe there's a man, Putin, who wants to restore the Soviet Union or the Tsarist Empire, and that's why he invades one country after another. I think the problem with many journalists is that they think they shouldn't report on criminal behavior, for example, in the government in Kyiv, because it would harm the good cause. They decide against writing about it. This decision is not only made by editors-in-chief, but it is so deeply ingrained in many journalists that they don't even come up with the idea to ask why the government in Kyiv simply lets people be shot who are considered disloyal. What kind of conditions are these in this country? They have already shot a lot of people who were labeled as traitors. These individuals are not brought to trial, but are simply killed with a gunshot to the head. For example, one of the delegates who participated in the talks in Istanbul on behalf of the government of Kiev was shot by the Secret Service while fleeing. You can't read about such incidents in our media. I think journalists have little time. They are always stressed because the media landscape is getting faster. That's a different problem, but also one of the factors in this whole dilemma. Journalists who research this would not write about it because they think that by doing so, they could harm the good cause, namely international law. We have to fight Russia. Putin's invasion must have consequences, and we must somehow win. Ukraine must prevail. This was repeatedly emphasized at the Munich Security Conference. But that's why we are in such a propagandistic time. So I also spoke with Jess Freeman, a former US ambassador, and he says we are living through a time that, in its propagandistic content, is more intense than anything he remembers from the fading McCarthy era. We are in a highly ideologized and strongly propagandized time. And what I wonder, I'm 38, has it always been like this? Did I just never notice? Or are we actually at a peak of propaganda right now? That it's so intense now, and maybe it will subside afterwards. And that maybe it was a little less before. Yes, I see it that way too. We are confronted with widespread censorship and propaganda that is fed to the media and then disseminated by them. This is based on the approximately 35,000 or 38,000 PR people, for example, employed by the American intelligence services and the State Department. They are on the payroll and have nothing else to do but spread a narrative that is currently in the interest of NATO countries. 
One could argue that on the Russian or Chinese side, there are probably just as many PR officials. That is beyond my knowledge, but it's quite possible. But that's not the point. It's more about the extent to which we seek the truth, the extent to which we do not, and the extent to which we are prevented from recognizing the truth. It's actually worse. I mean, in China and Russia, most people probably know that they're not getting the whole truth and can therefore place it into context differently. A Chinese student of mine once told me, we know what can and cannot be said. We all know how to interpret what we are presented with. It only becomes difficult when you find out that the government even monitors private text messages and certain things never get through. So, in their case, it goes much further. But the rest, meaning the Chinese, already know how they need to communicate with each other afterwards. But with us, if we assume that our quality media, the evening news, or as a comedian aptly puts it, the power at eight, tells us the truth. And if we believe that, if we believe that we are getting the whole truth and not just a part of it, well then we are in a cage of our own belief system. And then the control of the narrative is already quite good. I don't want to say there are evil conspirators at the top who want to control us. The thing is we deceive ourselves. We are deceiving ourselves. That's true. I just mentioned the factor of speed. The philosopher of speed, Paul Virilio, once said it's an industry of forgetting. In news broadcasts, what was said in the previous show is incessantly buried immediately again. That means a process is underway. I've always compared it to a sausage factory. There, the conveyor belts run so frantically fast that no one has time anymore to check what comes out of the sausage being produced. I worked for a long time on Tagesschau, on Swiss television. You never have time to check. The reports on Tagesschau are agency reports. Research is impossible with this work rhythm. In the morning on Tagesschau, at noon, in the evening, two, three, and so on. I once checked a case. I don't know how much time we still have. Can I tell it briefly? So, it was after 9-11. Ahmadinejad, the Iranian president, made an appearance at the United Nations and gave a speech. And the next day, the media reported that Ahmadinejad had said the Americans had done 9-11 themselves. Period. And that was also reported in the Swiss Tagesschau, in the noon broadcast where I happened to be on duty. And that sparked a huge storm of outrage and indignation throughout the West. From Obama to others, it was immediately said everywhere that this impossible warmonger from Tehran had claimed the Americans had staged 9-11 themselves. I looked into the matter and saw which images were received on the server of the Tagesschau at night and which comments were published about these images. They were all short agency reports. Ahmadinejad was quoted saying Bush and the Americans had staged it, but he had not said that. It took a while until I found the speech. He had spoken for about an hour or 45 minutes, I don't remember exactly. From this long speech, only this one sentence was quoted. Ahmadinejad had said this and that, but he had not said it. When I read the speech in the English translation, I saw that he said there were various explanations for 9-11. One explanation was that a group of hijackers had hijacked the planes and flown them into the towers. Another explanation was that the American intelligence service might have had a suspicion and let it happen. He gives three or four explanations and says many Americans question the official explanation. And then he says it would have been better to investigate these matters in international police cooperation instead of starting two wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, which have not brought any clarification in this respect. He also said he gave a long speech and made the usual sweeping statements about the colonial past of the West. He said, here is the Bible, there is the Quran, both books speak of peace, and he respects both books. It was essentially a rather conciliatory speech. But the only thing that came across is that Ahmadinejad said it was the Americans themselves, 
which journalists in the news broadcasts around the world had the time at that moment to research for half an hour, to first find the speech at the United Nations, which was complicated, and so on. And even if he had done that and wanted to make a more balanced report, it would not have been possible, because a report on the topic in the midday news might last maybe two minutes. In two minutes, you can't convey that at all. What I always notice is the tendency of our media to never reproduce anything in its original tone. Everything is presented pre-digested, so you never hear Donald Trump or Joe Biden in the original. You rarely get to listen to these individuals for an extended period or hear an entire speech in the original tone. Instead, you always hear only short excerpts. So you hear Putin for four hours giving answers to journalists' questions. Exactly. And the audacity of a Tucker Carlson to present the Russian president uncensored to a Western audience for two hours is astonishing. That something like this is possible, I find remarkable. The outcry over the Tucker Carlson interview, in my opinion, is an outcry over the fact that people can also listen to the original. This is seen as wrong, as evil. That reminds me of a good example. It wasn't always like this. I once had to search in the archives of the 1930s and accidentally came across an article from the Neutzercher Zeitung, NZZ, from September 1939, about Hitler's attack on Poland. At that time, Hitler gave a speech in which he presented his view of the situation regarding the attack. In my opinion, he still hoped that the British wouldn't really attack him. The NZZ printed the entire speech on the front page, a sea of lead type. Hitler's entire speech was printed verbatim, without changing a single sentence, on page one of the NZZ on September 1st, 1939. This shows how times have changed. Perhaps there were sympathies for Hitler in Switzerland at the time, that's quite possible, but it was a different kind of journalism. People wanted to know what he had to say. The NZZ would not print an entire page with the whole speech of Putin today. It's even worse. Putin wrote an article, I believe it was for the Süddeutsche Zeitung, in the summer of 2021, on the 70th anniversary of Operation Barbarossa. In this article, he wrote very conciliatorily, for example about the atrocities of the Nazis, not the Germans, just as he still does today. He also says today that we must not burden the Germans with the debts of their grandparents. The Süddeutsche published this article, and there was a huge outcry in Germany because the Süddeutsche dared to print it without providing journalistic commentary. I remember this very clearly. Subsequently, the Süddeutsche had to apologize. These are always just individual sentences that are circulated, and often they are cut off in such a way that the context suggests something completely different than what the sentences actually mean to say. Take the famous sentence from Putin, in which he said that the downfall of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe. However, in the same breath, he said that it would be nonsense or foolish to dream of a renaissance or re-establishment of the Soviet Union. This part of the sentence was left out because it did not fit the narrative. When I opened the newspaper or listened to the news, I could make such a comment about every third sentence. It's incredible how information is shortened and steered in a certain direction. It's just interesting how it's gradually becoming clumsier. That's why I feel that more people are slowly getting a bad feeling and trying to inform themselves differently, because the propaganda is becoming increasingly clumsy. However, I still have two important points that are close to my heart. On one hand, how do you explain that we always tell our students in school that one must consider both sides and think critically? We argue, especially in Switzerland. In Switzerland, we have a direct democracy, and then there are such initiatives. I remember, for example, the Horned Cow Initiative, 
which was about whether we should cut off cow's horns or prohibit this. It was controversially discussed, with many shades of grey, whether it is good or serves animal welfare. In these areas, we always say again and again that one must consider all aspects. But in the most important areas, like with COVID or in war, it seems as if everything is black and white. Whoever is not on the side of good is automatically on the side of evil. How do you explain that one can have this nuanced worldview of oneself on one hand, and on the other hand, everything is clearly divided into good and evil? Whoever holds a different opinion must therefore be evil. Yes, as I said, there are powerful PR industries at work. I just remembered something about what you said earlier. The media situation has changed significantly due to social media, that's clear. Powerful interest groups have recognized that social media can also pose a threat. They can be influenced, manipulated, and fake news can be spread. But social media have also offered a platform to many opposition voices. This danger has also been recognized. The high-tech companies in Silicon Valley are working closely with the Democrats, that is, with the Biden administration. There is comprehensive material censorship taking place. Content that does not fit the narrative is being deleted. We learned that through the Twitter files, through Meta and so on. This is now proven because Elon Musk made it public. Yes, and I think there's also something that the media does not pick up on. I read something here and there, but the enormous number of unwanted internet sites being deleted per day is immense. Millions of contents are removed daily. This has not yet entered the public consciousness, I have the impression. In my Syria archive, for example, I have many videos. When I click on these, it often says, video not available. Obviously, content is being deleted, and for me, that's a huge scandal. But the media does not address this. Why? Because everyone says hate speech and right-wing extremism must be deleted. And since it's only about right-wing extremists, hate preachers and conspiracy theorists, it seems to be completely okay that content is deleted. This is an incredibly delicate matter. Google has publicly announced that they will delete everything that can be defined as Russian propaganda. This means, if I have an internet link and I don't like the content, I can claim it's probably Russian propaganda, and then it will be deleted. Google employs thousands of people who do nothing but delete content. This scandal should actually be addressed in the media. But there is largely silence on this topic. People agree with it. I mean, RT and Sputnik are banned in the EU, fortunately not in Switzerland. This is one of the few moments I am still proud of Switzerland. Switzerland has officially stated that banning these stations would not fit our code of values. But this happens rarely, but now and then. Yes, that brings me back to what you said at the very beginning of our conversation. Is it worse or more intense than before? I think social media have contributed to censorship becoming stricter than before. That's just how it is. Things are being deleted over and over again under the pretext that it could be Chinese or Russian propaganda, and so on. And in this respect, I notice a frightening intensification of the attempt to create a uniformity of opinion. That's something that strikes me significantly at the moment. Just one very last question. I don't even bother reading Swiss or German media anymore. The reason is that I have this theory that anyway, 95% of what goes around about world events essentially comes directly from agencies in the USA. So I go directly to the New York Times, Washington Post, and a few other international media outlets. I feel like it's a trickle-down effect, because the Germans take what comes from the USA, and the Swiss take what comes from Germany. Is my assumption justified, or would you say that it's a bit more nuanced? I see it the same way. The influence of the US media is overwhelming. 
I have noticed that this was also the case during the Iraq War and in Afghanistan. The American media, such as the New York Times, have apologized to their readers for misinformation around the Iraq War. Both the New York Times and the Washington Post publish articles that are often more critical than those in Germany. This also applies to the influential political magazine Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy. I regularly read Foreign Affairs. In both magazines, not only are voices heard that advocate for the continuation of the war in Ukraine, behind some of which stands the arms industry, which has never made as much money as it is now. Opinions are also published that seek a different way out and criticize the entanglements with the huge arms industry. In the USA, there is an arms industry in more than 40 states. No representative of these states would advocate in parliament for the defense budget to be stopped or reduced. It is increased year by year. Every representative is afraid of losing their voters if they vote against the arms industry in their state. Wenn er gegen die Rüstungsindustrie in seinem Bundesstaat stimmt. This is the military industrial complex and so on, which has also been very well researched. It's just fascinating that this continues. And it's true what you're saying. So, it's not like our media are controlled 100% in some centralized way. It's more like a selection process. I published an article in Foreign Policy that speaks for neutrality and defends it. And the NZZ recently published a small article of mine about positive neutrality, that is, against NATO. So, other voices are indeed heard, but they seem to be relatively rarely noticed, I feel. We cannot claim that there is 100% uniformity, but the way information is disseminated is relatively clear. Well, I always have the impression that Americans are more practical. They often say business is business. If the business no longer works, then the war in Ukraine doesn't need to continue either. There are many people who think like Donald Trump. In Russia, they are called businessmen. Here they are called oligarchs. Well, Mr. Dr. Shaban, I would like to thank you very much for your insights. I hope that we can return to world events in the future, especially when events occur for which I would like to have the insights of a journalist. Yes, gladly. Thank you very much. I also thank you. It was a very good and interesting conversation. Thank you.